Hello, for our week of modernism, we're continuing with Virginia Woolf. In order to preserve and respect copyright, I'm going to keep giving you links to the music that I would play at the beginning because YouTube does not want me broadcasting those without proper permissions. You would be listening to Alessia Cara's Here, a song that's about somebody at a party who is unable to keep her mind on any given single thing. So I'm hoping that will be a good way of thinking about both a female voice and also thinking about the idea of, of course, the single phrase most connected to the way that Virginia Woolf writes, stream of consciousness. So what we're gonna do today is look at a very funny, sweet, small, and yet very impactful and political piece by Virginia Woolf, one of the most important experimental writers. And I hope you found the piece provocative and interesting. It's got an unusual style, but it has some of the most beautiful language around the enthusiasm for writing that I personally have ever encountered. But before we switch to the images, to my trying to make this experiment, someone not knowing quite how she will end the story she wants to start, I just wanted to begin with one very simple statement. There are a couple of things by Virginia Woolf I might have invited you to read, and I'm going to quote for the one I didn't include in the syllabus, along with offering an apology or at least an explanation, not an excuse. Why is Virginia Woolf in the early 20th century the first female author that we are reading? It's not because there weren't female authors before, and I've chosen works that actually have a lot of gender diversity, as well as all sorts of geographical and regional diversity, as well as obviously wide ranging time frames. But Wolf has a very interesting argument and one I wanted to share with you. In an essay she wrote called A Room of One's Own, she asked the question, why are there not more women authors? There are important epic writers in classical Japan Renaissance women poets, novelists like Jane Austen, who I suspect all of you have now heard of. But why are there so few prior to the 20th century? And Wolf has a very simple and direct answer. Because they did not have a space, nor did they have the leisure and time to write. Women, traditionally at least, are the ones who are constantly the taking care individual, the one who's living for others the one who is in a space that is shared, preparing domestic and other necessaries of life. In the midst of the current crisis, I think we're all aware how all genders can participate in taking care of people. But for Wolf, the luxury in time and space and commodity terms, the luxury of having a room in which you could quietly write is something that women did not very often get until the 20th century. And I wanted us to begin the 20th century with Proust. Actually, Proust is a wonderful connection to Wolf. Proust was uh, the reason Wolf had her writer's block, like Baudelaire. In the context of having read Proust's Remembrances of Things Past, or In Search of Lost Time, my preferred title for it, Wolf realized that he'd done all the kinds of things she'd like to do. And then she has an idea about taking things even further. So I want to talk with you a bit about Wolf's London, I want to talk with you a bit about Wolf's style, and then I want to take you into the text itself and look at a couple of moments with you today. So please do listen to the Alicia Cara piece if you have a time to do it, because I think it's a nice connection. But now I'd like us to take the opportunity to look at what uh, Wolf was and what we know about her and how she lives in a global consciousness, especially about authors who identify as female. What you have here is a montage of photographs of Wolf. Again, the photograph is something I want us to keep in mind as a way of thinking about what does literature do? What does art do? Once one art form, the photograph is available. I give you a picture of her as young because a simple matter I want to raise with you is Wolf, unlike her brothers, because of her gender, had to be homeschooled. Like so many of you sitting at home just at the moment on Zoom, listening to a recorded lecture from me, Wolf was denied direct access to face-to-face -face education, unlike people who purely by the accident of their birth were allowed to go to school and on to university. She lived in London and was part of an extremely influential, the so-called Bloomsbury Group or Bloomsbury Circle, group of avant-garde writers and artists that included people like T.S. Eliot, the American poet, and particularly perhaps James Joyce, the great Irish novelist. 
So we know a great deal about her and about her life. We know about her gender, we know about her sexuality, and perhaps one of the things that we're most preoccupied with, and I always want to just limit that for a second, but mention it, is how her life ended. She suffered from mental health issues for the entirety of her life, ultimately during the Second World War, taking her own life. She killed herself. So that narrative is there, that narrative is present. But I want to use it as the occasion of mentioning something that's core to the text I've asked you to look at. Often, people who have intersectional identities that involve race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, etc., when we read their texts, get flattened out as being documentary. Proust is telling us what it's like to be a gay man living in Paris. Wolf is telling us what it's like to be someone living with mental health issues during the Second World War in London. Well, in some ways that's true, but as Wolf will beautifully say to us at the end, actually, persons of color, LGBTQ plus people, I'm going to insist, do actually have imaginations as well. Her text grows out of her experience and she invokes it as directly as Proust does. But like Proust, she's also making things up and in fact, taking great pleasure and great joy in that imaginative process and sharing them with us. So what does her imaginative process look like? And I'm gonna stay with the idea of impressionist painting. As I mentioned last time, impressionism, or being an impressionist, was actually an art critic's nasty, unkind remark about people who didn't do proper paintings with enough detail and accuracy. So I'm taking another French, a contemporary of Proust, another French artist, Claude Monet, probably one of the best known of this group of impressionist painters who simply defied what a painting was supposed to look like because he made a trip to London and did a whole series of images of London. So if I show you this image of the Houses of Parliament, you might have seen these recently because of all of the reporting from London, it's not a very good picture. It's not actually what the Houses of Parliament look like. And yet, on a foggy London afternoon, when the water is sparkling because the sunrise is just coming over, or the sun is setting because it's reflecting off the water, this might be very much the way those Houses of Parliament look. Even artists, and this is an English artist who's also contemporary with Wolf, even artists who are not so obviously impressionistic, this is John Atkinson Grimshaw, who does lots of cityscapes in the period, London Bridge at Half Tide, even he, although he has a lot more typically crisp and clear imagery here, is going to be preoccupied with capturing for us a moment, the feel of a space, the feel of a moment. Grimshaw, and this is one of the streets I lived on in London. If we take one of his images, and here we are in the late afternoon, just as the gas lights are coming on in Hampstead, which is a, used to be a suburb of London, now it's very much part of London, NW3, will ask us to feel that exact moment, like Pizarro, giving us blurry images in the background, anonymous people that we cannot completely identify. Were I to add a filter to it, I could change the feel of that image entirely. Same image, I've just darkened the filter. Now we seem to find ourselves in a kind of Sherlock Holmes, Jack the Ripper, gloomy, dangerous London street. The Impressionists wanted to place us there. If I return to Monet, here we're back in downtown London and you can see what's now called Queen Elizabeth Town with the famous bell Big Ben in it at the center. In some ways it's a bad painting. Why doesn't he bother to paint the boats? Why doesn't he color in all the water? Why are the two men who are out on this pier here so indistinct we can't even see who they are? Even these landmarks are barely recognizable. It's because Monet is not interested in taking a photograph of London. He wants us to let us know what it's like on that misty afternoon. Here, moving a little bit to the west of London, we're now in Greenwich. Here, Monet again is going to, sorry, east of London. Monet is here again going to give us an image of what a place feels like. Perhaps one might say, especially capturing the smokiness, the dirtiness, the pollutedness of late 19th and early 20th century London. Even here in a beautiful park, Green Park, that's right at the center of London, he doesn't actually give us crisp, clear images of the humans. You might be able to detect that this person is dressed as an adult male and this person is dressed as a child female but everything is indistinct. It's as though it's the glance, that first look that we have as we look across the beautiful lawn without all the particulars drawn in. 
It's the way our mind sees things in that split second start. One of the images I want to give just because of the transformation of it is the way in which Claude Monet invites us to see Waterloo Bridge. It's one of the main arteries into London and it's right in the center of town, very important for all kinds of business, uh, commerce going across and you would see all of the traffic that's on it as well as all of these uh, smokestacks in the background. So a bit like Petersburg and a bit like Paris, I want to suggest that London, early 20th century London is very much a character in this story. London is one of those large metropolitan centers. It's a place where people may live if they have a great deal of money, but it's much more a place to which people commute over bridges on trains. And of course, the entirety of the text that you read takes place on a train, as we're allowed to deduce a little bit through the second page. If I switch to this image, and it's the identical bridge and the identical vantage point, just like the Pizarro, you get that strong, even gloomy sense of an alienated large city. And one of the things that happened at the end of the 19th century in the period that both Proust wrote about, but especially Wolf is writing about, because she talks about travel in and out of the city, is this is the period when commuting happened, when not everyone could live in town, not everybody wanted to live in town, but often could live in town. And so people would go back and forth from the countryside to the city. And I wanted us again to have this image of the London fog. It's a real thing. It's not just a company that makes raincoats. The London fog, which was a, an inversion layer, a smog layer that covered all of the city of London right through to the 1950s and 1960s. And it gave it this fuzzy blurriness as though you didn't quite know the way things were, as though you couldn't completely see clearly.